test. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to a conversation about the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension Project, and in particular, the Elevated Guideway. My name is Joseph Thornley. I am the CEO of 76 Engage, Metrolinx's public engagement partner for virtual consultation. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's event, and as such, I'll aim to keep the event on time, ensure your questions are answered as clearly and completely as possible, and make sure as many questions are answered as possible. Now, one important note, if you are watching this on your computer, and if you would like to have closed captioning, you can turn on closed captioning by mousing down to the bottom of the video screen and clicking on the CC link, and then you'll get uh, real-time closed captioning. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations. Metrolinx wishes to recognize the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We acknowledge that Metrolinx operates on these lands and has a responsibility to work with the original keepers of this territory and the many diverse Indigenous peoples living here today. In particular, we acknowledge that the Eglinton Crosstown West project is taking place on the traditional lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the Six Nations of the Grand River and Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council. Metrolinx remains committed to engaging with Indigenous nations on the Eglinton Crosstown West extension. Now, let's look at the format. What can you expect this evening? We've scheduled this evening's session to last about an hour and a half. We will begin with a presentation and then take as many questions and answer as many questions as possible. If you look at the screen, you can see the presentation materials just below the video player, uh, and you can download those for later reference. As for the questions, if you look immediately to the left of the presentation materials, and again, just below the video, you can see questions that people have submitted in advance. I'd encourage you to review the existing questions and vote for the ones that you would most like to hear answers to live during this evening's uh, session. And when I look at it right now, there's about 112 questions that have already been submitted. So vote for the ones that you most want to hear. This evening, we'll also have a call-in option for people who want to make your voice heard. You'll find a link to the call-in question Zoom room immediately below the presentation materials. And you can follow that link and go over into a room where you can ask your question and you'll be heard by everybody on the call. 
We'll begin by spending 30 minutes answering the written questions, and then we'll spend about 30 minutes answering the Zoom audio questions. The written questions we're tackling on the basis of the number of total votes, but also uh, we're trying to make sure that all of the major uh, areas are addressed. So we're, we're picking questions that will address all of the areas. When we get to the Zoom room, we're going to take your questions on a first come first served basis. And what we'll ask is if you can, please be brief. We'd like to keep each of the audio questions uh, to about three minutes, that'll allow us to get through more of them. But if you submit a question and you still can submit written questions during the meeting, if you don't feel comfortable asking an audio question, even if you submit a written question and we don't get to it tonight, Metrolinks will be answering the questions here on Metrolinks Engage on this same page sometime over the, the coming week or so. So you will get answers to all of your questions again. If you need closed captioning, just click on the CC at the bottom of the video uh, window and you'll be able to see the closed captioning. So I'd now like to introduce our panel. Tonight we have Joshua Engelian, who is the program sponsor for Eglinton Crosstown West Extension Project. With him is Peter Olak, Technical Director for the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension, and Elmira Mogani, the Project Manager for the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension. Finally, we have John Potter, Design Manager for Metrolinks. Welcome, Josh, Peter, Elmira, and John. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, Great to have everyone here this evening, although I can't see you. Look forward to hearing from some of you. Uh, very pleased to be joining you virtually. Look forward to be joining you in the future, hopefully in person. So uh, Chris, if you can take us to the next slide. Uh, and I think Joseph covered this one, so the next one. Uh, as we do at Metrolinks, we like to start all of our meetings with the safety moment. So I'll just highlight that uh, for those of you who are 70 and over, uh, as well as people who received their first dose of Pfizer or Moderna and on or before April 18th, you are eligible to book a second dose appointment. Uh, and we have identified a website there for your second dose of the COVID vaccine. I know I care for a, a vulnerable person in my household, uh, so I have my appointment tomorrow and looking forward to that. Uh, and you can find in, more information there. So Chris, next slide, please. So just a, a little bit of table setting here. So the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension is a 9.2 kilometer extension of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT west from Mount Dennis all the way to Renforth in Mississauga. And then we are also working closely with GTAA, the Greater Toronto Airport Authority, on the planning of a further connection from Renforth to Pearson. Uh, along this alignment, uh, it starts as an underground uh, section, and that's the blue color for about 600 meters through the Mount Dennis community. Then it goes to a 1.4 kilometer elevated segment across Jane and the, and the Humber River Valley and Scarlet, which is the main focus of our uh, presentation material and look forward to getting your input on the guideway today. And then there's a 6.2 kilometer underground section um, from just west of Scarlet. Overall, there are seven stations at Mount Dennis, Jane, Scarlet, Royal York, Islington, Kipling, Martin Grove, and Renforth. Uh, so, in, why are we doing this project? Uh, and, I, and Metrolinks has a practice, and you can see on our website, our business case for the project is published if anyone wants more information. And as we move through the design of the project, we continue to update that business case. But there are many benefits to this project. Uh, really, it's about creating connections, connections from Mississauga all the way through Etobicoke, through Toronto, and into Scarborough with, you know, Know, so 26 kilometers uh, to Renforth, 33 kilometers to the airport. So that generates a lot of interest, a lot of ridership. It reduces emissions and it creates a faster, more reliable trip 
by transit for a lot of people and brings people and jobs a lot closer to rapid transit. So especially as we recover from COVID and things get busier, these types of connections are really important. And, it, and especially creating these east-west connections through the city that connect a lot of the existing north-south rapid transit spines like the subway and the GO lines. Um, it, this line will also provide a strong connection to the Mississauga Transitway, uh, which is currently in place and provides uh, rapid bus connections through Mississauga. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of information on this slide outlining the timeline. I'm going to pick out a few things. Uh, first of all, I'd like to highlight and we're excited to say, and it's been a subject of some recent media releases that, you know, while we are working on the planning of this project, also uh, the construction has begun. We have signed a contract with uh, a group called West End Connectors that will be building the tunneled segment from Brenforth to just before Scarlet. So that's that 6.2 kilometer section. The tunnel boring machines will be launched into the ground at Renforth and Eglinton. So you can see in that yellow bar, uh, that's where uh, the early works are starting through the summer. Uh, and we'll look forward to announcing more on that, the actual boring machines we expect to arrive on site uh, in the early phases of 2022. And that construction on the tunnel will, will, will really start in earnest in 2022, um, all the way through to 2025. At the same time, we are working on the planning and the design of, of the, the bigger piece of the project, what we call the station rail and systems piece, and the elevated guideway is part of that. Uh, so we are early in that process. So this is a great time to be doing public engagement, getting your feedback on that. As part of that, we are doing a, a, a number of environmental studies, uh, doing a full tree inventory, understanding the birds and the wildlife in the area so that we can, that can influence our, our construction means, methods and timelines. Uh, so, and we'll refer to that through, I'm sure the presentation and the questions. And we plan to be back to you every month on different topics. So our focus today is on the elevated guideway. We look forward to coming back in July with West End Connectors to talk more about the actual tunnel, what the approach to the construction and the timing will be, and get the community's input um, as that work starts. So next slide, please. So the focus of today's presentation is the elevated guideway uh, that runs from just west of Scarlet to just after Jane. It's again about one and a half kilometers. Uh, the, this project for the guideway will be delivered, as you can see here, as part of the station rail and system scope. Um, but there are uh, connecting pieces at Eglinton that you'll see in a minute that will be delivered as part of the advanced tunnel scope. So this elevated guideway is a little ways away. Um, and again, this is the right time to be getting your feedback and we're excited to bring forward uh, concepts and, and get your thoughts on them. Next slide, please. And really a big reason why we focused on the elevated guideway for, you know, this is, I, you, you could say this is the first engagement where we've gone into more detail on one specific aspect is because in our early uh, broader engagements, we heard so much feedback uh, from the general community as well as from groups like the Mount Dennis Community Association on the elevated guideway. So what have we heard so far? Uh, we've heard a lot of uh, questions and concerns about impacts to the beautiful natural area uh, for Key Brown Park, Eglinton Flats, and looking to minimize the size uh, of the guideway, the, how it blends in with the, with the local area, the natural area, uh, and reduces impacts to trees, protects red, uh, migrating birds and other animals. Uh, we've heard about the Humber and the importance of the Humber. Uh, and then questions around construction and noise and vibration. So we're going to talk to some of those things. We just really wanted to identify these are some of the key things that we've heard so far. Um, and we are also providing information about how you can reach out to us individually or in smaller groups if you want to have more detailed conversations. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, 
So this is not, uh, this is connected to the elevated guideway, but I wanted to highlight uh, a couple things, first of all. So just west of Scarlet is the interface point between the tunnel and the elevated guideway. So this is where during construction, we will remove or extract the tunnel boring machines from the ground. And then once the line is in operation, this is when the, where the trains will come from underground to the elevated guideway, as you can see uh, as an example of, uh, you know, the line under construction uh, for the Eglinton Crosstown LRT there. So the work here uh, to make room for the extraction shaft and the ultimate portal for the trains uh, does require us to realign Eglinton to the south. Um, so the next slide gives a bit more detail on that. So here is a, is a rendering. You can see here where it says portal. That's, that's the area where we're uh, realigning Eglinton approximately 10 meters to the south in the area from the pedestrian bridge to Scarlet Road. So this makes room for that portal. Um, and we have worked very closely with City of Toronto, transportation, planning and urban design, uh, because this is a municipal road, to make sure this can be done in a, in a way that protects for the future uh, to maintain the sidewalk and the paths in the area uh, and, and can ensure the safe functioning of Eglinton Avenue, both during construction and after. So this piece of work on the realignment of Eglinton will happen as part of the tunnel contract, which means that this construction will start in 2022. Um, during the construction, the uh, as part of the tunnel, the driveway to those residential buildings to the north will be able to remain open. But as is indicated there, once the guideway is built, then that then that driveway will need to be closed permanently. Uh, and we are working with uh, the landowners there. We are working with the city of Toronto on, on traffic analysis to make sure that the, the cars can still flow and see what mitigations are required with the ultimate closing of that driveway. We've also met with uh, residents along Richview to talk about their concerns and thoughts around traffic and other issues for the project. Um, so we will be coming back with more information on what mitigations are required, but I I did want to highlight that that's this is really the connection point between the tunnel and the guideway and this is some of the work that will be starting in 2022. So next slide and with that I'm going to pass it on to John Potter to take you through some of the more exciting stuff about the elevated guideway and lessons from elsewhere. Yes thank you Josh so I'm going to start we're going to I'll take you through some of the principles that have guided us in these uh, in the design of the elevated guideway. I'll talk about a little late in a few slides about you know how we're looking at the um, treatment of the ground plane under the guideway, and we just to be so you're confident. Um, a lot of those concepts are actually taken from the feedback we've received from the community. So starting with the design principles that inform the elevated guideway. You know, excuse my cat. The guideway should be a simple, linear, and elegant structure that in, minimizes visual impacts to the surrounding context. That's that's a kind of an important piece, and I'll talk a little more about when I introduce the Davenport Diamond President uh precedent you know another principle is of course treating the underside or the land the land at grade below the elevated guideways the integral part of the surrounding landscape you know as we've heard you don't want to you don't want gravel or stones underneath we see this as a contiguous um extension of the adjacent landscape of boulevards we also will be considering opportunities for public realm improvements, but that will always be done in conjunction with um, negotiations with our key municipal partners. Um, we, you know, we always are looking to improve connections for pedestrians, cyclists, and pre vehicular traffic. And most importantly, perhaps, is that we want to uh, respond to environmentally sensitive features such as the Humber River Valley, the Eglinton Fat, Flats and Free Brown Park, and we want to preserve the views at grade um, to the surrounding naturalized areas. Next slide, please. 
OK, so you know, I'm going to the next two slides kind of go through some precedents, both local and from across the globe. And, you know, the center image is actually from a project Metrolinx is um, constructing it right now, and it's the Davenport Diamond uh, grade separation. That project comes with a complementary um, public realm project because, you know, so it's an interesting, we learned a lot of lessons on that project, and these are lessons we've been bringing forward to this, ele the ECWE elevated guideway. And there you see a few other precedents from around the world. So, Locally, besides the Davenport Diamond, oh, can we move forward one? Hmm. Um, next slide. I don't know. Uh, are you seeing the second slide on the yellow bay guideway press? There it is. Okay, so I, I hope most of you have had a chance to visit the Bentway in Toronto. Now, that's not exactly a, a, a you know ex, a exact precedent because it's under a much taller, much wider structure. But it gives you it starts to give you a sense of the range of opportunities for how you program the spaces below these guideways. And we heard from you that you you know you want seating and. Uh, trails etc so these are the kind of things we'll be uh, thinking about moving forward and especially as we work with the city of toronto and i think a good example is the valley line lrt in edmonton which is currently under construction and you can see the the lower three images give you some ideas the the two on the left are renderings of what's coming but the image on the right is an actual um photograph showing Oh, you know how the LRT comes out of a portal and crosses uh, the you know a river valley. So next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about the design principles informing the elevate guideways, but there's also design drivers that we are looking at as we look you know you know review the impacts to the parks and the adjacent public realm. And when we when we talk about design drivers, we're really talking about aspirational objectives for the project and these drivers are the key concepts that un mitigating impacts or you know at grade to adjacent parks the boulevard etc so you know i'm just going to go through four of obviously and this is a an element that you asked about is endeavor to protect existing trees and vegetation. One thing that we've learned is that if you know you want to start planting early because any any you know new plantings to offset any vegetation clearance, it takes time to for the benefits to accrue. So you want to start planting early. Um, we always focus on low maintenance, all season vegetation, because you want this, this landscape to you know, look healthy um, regardless of the season, but you don't want uh, us to plant uh, trees and shrubs that are not going to survive or last very long. And probably most importantly, protect parks and recreation spaces. Next slide, please. Um, the next slide is, you know, basically it's it it's the landscape you are familiar with. It's it, you know, every you know as we move forward with the design, it is absolutely critical that it's grounded in a in a substantive and you know understanding of a, the site specific context in which we are building. And so we have we have spent time out there. We'll be spending more time out there. You know, we want to understand, you know, the impacts of what we're doing and how and how we can bring added amenity to this this part of the city. So next slide. So from here, the next slide moves on to an interesting but related uh, um, sort of design concept, and that's the the bird protection patterns and stations and structures. And it was interesting because um, one of the questions raised by, you know, the community was, are, what are we doing to protect birds, um, either migratory or resident birds? And we had developed uh, bird protection 
it's originally developed for the protective barriers that are going to be installed on bridges that span over our new electrified go rail corridors but it's it's a pattern that has you know is can be used in many applications including in this case on the stations and the reason for bird friendly patterns is as you probably all know that unlike humans birds don't have the ability to perceive clear glasses uh solid objects so we apply these patterns to the transparent panels and stations or bus shelters etc so then the question is why a morse code for a pattern and that's really because as many people who um, studied history and even in high school we know that canadian history is um, rich with myths and one of them you know there's a kind of an association with the founding of the canadian european canadian nation state not the the you know not the um the country that existed before the Europeans arrived, but the, the sort of modern nation state, the sort of transcontinental railway is one of the, is part of the founding myth. And the telegram was, was part of, you know, always seen hand in hand with the railway. And there's good reason for that because believe it or not, the railway, you know, a, the railways gave a good corridor for the telegraph, but it all, the the railway companies actually used uh, the telegraph and Morse, Morse code to control the movement of their station, their trains across the network, and it was the only way they could actually have a flexible scheduling system. Um, so we're going to be using Morse code, and the importance is that the Morse code is going to be used, you know, will spell out regional or local place name. So it's very much tied both to the history of the country, tied to the you know railways and tied to the local community. So next slide. So I'm gonna hand this off to Amira, who's gonna to speak to the process by which we arrived at the preferred design solution for the elevated guideways. So Amira, take it away. Thank you, John. Uh, in terms of the elevated guide bait design, we looked at different options um, for the alignment as well as the guide book design itself. For the alignment, we are proceeding our design with the alignment closer to Eglinton. It runs parallel to Eglinton Avenue West on the north side of Eglinton, sitting on the road embankment. Uh, there are we looked at different criteria and we are proceeding with design because this alignment will have less impacts to the wildlife habitats, wetlands, heritage landscaping, and also to the TRCA floodplain in the area. In addition, if we are closer to Eglinton, it means that for during construction, we will have access from Eglinton to different construction site area, which will reduce impacts to the wooded area north of Eglinton within Eglinton Flat. In addition, uh, we, will, we will not impact uh, uh, the Eglinton flat uh, and um, we, will, we will have a passenger interchange and the intersection of Eglinton and Jane. For the design of the guideway, we looked at three different options. They are all precast concrete options and all options are um, basically uh, uh, within, um, we looked at different factors like aesthetics, constructability, construction duration, and also co capital cost. Also, we looked at the urban integration and how it can nicely fit within the environment and within the context of the Eglinton Flats. The options that we are proceeding uh, with is the box girder option. It proposed a smaller uh, structure uh, which has less visual impact in the area compared to precast and new girders. In addition, it will have less constructability challenges compared to u trough girder and therefore this is the best option that we are moving forward in terms of uh, guide bait design. Next slide please. We are showing you different um, views of Eglinton um, elevated guideway alignment here. This is from uh, Fergie Brown Park looking south. As you see, there is enough distance from the 
uh, sport field to the elevated guideway. And there is wooded area on the north side, and it can be restored, or we can plant additional trees after construction to minimize impact from the view of the elevated guideway, which is closer to the to the Ellington Avenue. In addition, we are proposing specific structural features. For example, here you are seeing a guide rail here. This is a proposed feature that can be changed based on your feedback. We want to have a simple structure that can nicely fit within the wooded area and within the Eglinton flat and have a less visual impact in the area. Next slide, please. Here, there is a view from south. The spans uh, are like approximately 40 meter. There are spacing between the piers Here's uh, the clearance underneath the guideway is around six meter. As you see, there is a wide boulevard on the north side. We are working closely with City of Toronto to propose uh, landscaping and public realm underneath the elevated guideway. We hear your comments. We know that you don't want sea gravel underneath these elevated guideways. So we will we will develop our design. We will come back and present what we are proposing along this guideway. Next slide. Okay, the, um, adopting the consistent span length um, will create minimal visual discrepancy along the alignment. This is from Jane looking east. This will be connected, uh, this will connect to the Jane portal going to the tunnel um, on the east side of Jane. As you see, there are a uh, large space underneath the guideway. Uh, we, we are not blocking any, any views underneath. This area can be developed further uh, and can be improved uh, having your feedbacks by having your feedbacks on, on the design. Next slide. Uh, this is further west. This is Humber Crossing. It is 244 meter Humber Crossing. The pier height here is around 16 to 18 meter. And as you can see, it says north of existing Humber uh, Bridge. It is higher than existing bridge. It means that if you walk along the sidewalk on the north side of existing bridge, you will still have a nice view of the uh, uh, Humber Valley. We are not blocking. Um, I, we heard your concern, and this rendering shows that uh, you can still have a perfect view of the river. Next slide. Thank you. In terms of design, we looked at different factors. For example, hydraulic impact, um, any, any geotechnical impact, any environmental impact that we may have by constructing piers within the Humber Valley. We are designing the, the elevated guideway in this location, having clear spanning uh, the Humber River to avoid any permanent structure within the watercourse. This will avoid any impact to fish habitats also. Uh, in order to minimize hydraulic impacts uh, in the area, we are spacing the, guide, the piers similar to the piers for the bridge on the south side. During construction, we will make sure that you have access to the trails on the east and west side of Humber River. In addition, we will make sure that you have access along the Humber River for any ceremonial events. Next slide, please. Back to you, Josh. Thanks, Elmira. I think you just need to go on mute now. Uh, great. So. Uh, we wanted to get this presentation done in 30 minutes. We're just two minutes over, so we almost made it. Um, we're excited to get your answer your questions, to get your proposed feedback. Um, our, as I mentioned, our next virtual engagement will is scheduled for Tuesday, July 13th. The focus of that session will be on the tunneling contract. We'll be meeting with folks from West End Connectors, the contractors uh, who will be building the tunnel. And uh, again, as we've mentioned before, 
if you would like to set up a smaller group meeting for you and your neighbors or others, please contact us um, through, through the website or through our email address and we'll work with you to get that started. Um, so now uh, we'll move forward to answering questions. Okay, thank you, Josh and uh, Amira, Peter, John, that was really good information. It, it's really getting real when you start to see uh, those uh, designs. So there are some questions. People have questions, and uh, we're going to start off right at the beginning with talking about station spacing. Uh, and this is from an Aaron Gate resident who has indicated that it's very disappointing that there's no stop between Martin Grove and Renforth Station. Uh, can you explain the options? Is it possible to have this changed and how is that possible? Yeah, I can answer that question, Joseph, and thank you very much for your question. Um, so as as we mentioned before, there are seven stations along the alignment from Mount Dennis to um, to Renforth. Uh, in your specific area, you're asking about a station between Martin Grove and Renforth. That is the you're right that that is the longest space on the line that we have without a station, as the tunneled alignment is really in that area going through. Um, the whole controlled access highway area where you have the 401, the 427. So it's a, it is from a kind of construction perspective, it, we have a lot of constraints in terms of what we can do in that area um, because of all the other road infrastructure that exists. Um, so we, if, if there's ever changes in the future, you know, we've we've protected for the ability to include stations, but really uh, we, we don't have an ability to provide an additional station there. Um, another thing to mention, though, is there will continue to be, you know, bus connections to make really good connections to Renforth and the other uh, Eglinton Crosstown West Extension stations. And we've been working closely with TTC to make sure that there's a really good bus to rapid transit interface. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, Josh. Uh, you showed us uh, elevations of the guideway. And um, the next question is about its height at its maximum point. So if we were to look at the guideway, including the sound wall, um, how high at its highest point would that elevated guideway, the elevated platform actually be from the ground? So I can start and then I'm going to I'm going to play traffic cop on these questions, Joseph. So then I'm going to pass it over to, okay. to Peter. Um, so in terms of a sound wall, I'm not sure if the questioner is referring to the railing or if they're commenting on there being a sound wall. Uh, we, we have no plans at this time to build a sound wall. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk to noise and vibration, but we've done a lot of studying of noise and vibration and, and we'll continue to study that as the designs evolve. But at this point in time, we have not identified a need for a sound wall. Um, but in terms of the specific elevation of the guideway, maybe Peter, can you speak to that? Uh, yes, Josh, um, thank you for that. And um, um, just to... Um, reinforce the fact that um, as, uh, based on the work that we've undertaken to date um, as part of the environmental assessment studies and also subsequent environmental studies, um, it does not indicate the need for a sound wall um, to uh, reduce the, the noise in the corridor. With respect to the uh, specific uh, elevations of the, um, uh, of the elevated guideway, um, I, I think we, we are looking at, um, say, crossing the Humber Valley um, around the 16 metre uh, range. Um, I think that's probably the highest point of the of the elevated guideway. OK, uh, thank Elmira, you. Elmira, anything else to add to that or? I just uh, I would like to just add one note uh, at crossing at Jane, Scarlett and Emmett. We need a minimum clearance of six meters from the road curve. 
It means that plus additional superstructure height, which is 2.5 meter, we will be around 8 meter from the from the roadside. OK, thank you. Um, and and just Almera, when you were showing us the designs and there was uh, the uh, what the upright bars that formed uh, a visual cover uh, for part of the the, the trains, um, and you you mentioned sound walls, Josh. Um, have you done any studies? Is that does that do anything with the sound? Those upright uh, bars, uh, or is that just for visual blending? Go ahead, Almira. Uh, I think uh, you're referring to the side walls that those are railings yes. that say the wooden color. Those are just, just the railing and it's functional. This is uh, for the guideway for the sidewalks along the alignment, along the elevated guideway. Uh, and this is also acts as our archi architectural feature of the elevated guideway. Yes. Um, so, and it. Josh. Its purpose is visual, not sound. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, I'm, this is a comment, uh, probably more than a question, um, but um, billions of new federal funds will cover the cost to continue uh, tunneling west of Mount Dennis. Um, can you please scrap overpass stations Jane, at Jane and Scarlet and then the comment is obviously the motivation is to save trees, parks, wildlife. Uh, so that that is a that is a position. Can you respond to that concern? Sure, happy to, Joseph. Um, and yes. Uh, so first of all, I think we 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 hear the the kind of underlying concern there being impact to trees, impact to parks that we've you know referred to. We've heard it. Um, and we're doing our best to design an alignment and a guideway that will both minimize the impact to the trees, as well as, you know, we're working closely with Toronto Regional Conservation Authority to replant trees and do that early uh, before construction starts uh, in the community. But uh, as specifically it relates to the funding and the new funding, uh, first of all, we're thrilled uh, to hear the federal support for this project and, and other subway projects that Metrolinx is working on. Um, that doesn't, uh, I wish, but it doesn't create new money, or it doesn't increase our budget uh, for the project. Um, it, it just means that both the province and the federal governments are contributing towards these important projects and are, and are acknowledging their importance and supporting them. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. OK, thank you for that. Um, let's talk a bit. Uh, I talked about uh, seeing uh, the drawings and, and here's a questioner who's actually wondering when site plans, elevation, concept drawings of the above grade section uh, of the Jane and Scarlet stations, the Humber River overpass, when will something more advanced uh, be available for the public to view? More advanced, more, uh, Joseph, more than, mature, than, and than these drawings, right? Is that, yes. is that the question? Okay. Yes. Uh, Peter, can you address that question, please? Yes, I can, and and thank you for the question. So, um, uh, at the moment, we are at the um, uh, planning stage of the of the study, um, and um, in, in terms of the planning stage, we are developing, we are undertaking uh, options analysis. Um, and clearing uh, to to get to a point where we have um, recommended options, um, and at, at, we are looking at run about uh, the fall um, to to come back with um, um, firmed up uh, designs that that are capable uh, to be talked to and and have the relevant details that that would um, uh, solicit enough uh, co uh, comments from the from the public. OK, and and in the autumn and Josh, you had talked about ongoing public engagement. Will that be at some stage uh, made public and, and presented in a way that the public will be able to review and comment? For sure, 
for sure. And so this is, um, you know, we, we recognize that this is really the first time that people have had a chance to get a better look at both precedents that John presented, as well as renderings of what we're proposing. Um, so before it was more of a line on a map, now it's starting to become a visualization. We're still in those early planning stages, but the feedback that we get right now is very important for us to use in that kind of planning and design process that Peter's talking about so that we can come back with more details in the fall. Okay, thank you. The next question is just one step to the left, um, but still coming in the same area. Uh, environmental reviews. Um, the question suggests that uh, environmental, substantive environmental reviews are one of the conditions outlined in the federal funding agreement. And uh, so the question is, Will there be and when will new assessments be completed for, in particular, Eglinton Flats? Uh, thanks, Joseph. So as part of the 2020 EPR or the Environmental Project uh, Report, as it's called, we that was an addendum. So we updated uh, the previous version of the Eglinton West uh, environmental assessment and approvals. So we received those environmental approvals last year. Um, as I was mentioning, um, so that sort of forms the basis for the bulk of our environmental approvals on the project. We are working very closely with TRCA um, on the designs of the of this infrastructure, uh, but both to minimize the impacts as well as to ensure that they are, you know, constructible and we have the right approach and all those kinds of things. Um, so that's certainly an important stakeholder for us. Uh, uh, and then, you know, we're going to continue to do work on things like tree inventories, species analysis and inventories to inform our kind of construction means and methods. Um, and and I guess, Peter, is there anything else that we, that I'm missing in terms of outstanding environmental approvals on the project? Um, so so um, uh Assuming the design doesn't change from the approval from the ones that we've got approvals from, um, the, there will be no uh, environmental approvals required on the project. However, um, as we continue with the uh, design development and um, the project progresses, we continue to undertake additional environmental studies uh, for a number of reasons, but the main reason is to confirm the uh, results from the previous studies that we've undertaken to make sure that we still fall within the tolerance of the approvals that we received previously. So the studies will continue right up until um, the the uh, construction stage. That's that's when we will we'll, uh, reduce the the environmental studies. But otherwise, we it's a continuous exercise uh, to be able to confirm the um, the results that we've received previously. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, I just, uh, for people who are on the call, um, we've actually had about 50 questions that have been added, uh, written questions during the course of the meeting. And so clearly the presentation has provided information that has sparked questions from people. And again, if you don't get uh, your question answered during this live session, Metrolinks will be going through and in, in uh, the period of time following this meeting answering questions. There is, however, uh, on your screen, the call in with your questions uh, note and the link to the Zoom room. So if you happen to be someone who uh, wants to actually ask your question out loud uh, in, in an audio portion in about 15 minutes, just click on that link and join Kelly Thornton, who is over in the Zoom room and will be, uh, will be allowing you to ask your questions in about 15 minutes. So we're, we're going through some more written questions um, that I see the people are still submitting. So here's one. Um, as the residents of Mount Dennis want uh, the project, the right of way, completely underground, uh, will Metrolinx revert to the original business plan and tunnel through Mount Dennis? Uh, thanks, Joseph. I'm 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 happy to take that one. So, 
Um, there have been many discussions over the years about this line uh, of starting, you know, fully underground, fully at grade, um, a, a mix of both. So specifically in the Mount Dennis community of the of the built area from the Mount Dennis station at Weston Road to just before Jane Street, that area will be tunneled as part of this project. Um, and and as we've said before, um, we've we've committed that we're not going to deliver that underground section as cut and cover. It will be a board tunnel, a tunneled approach, board approach, um, so that to minimize the disruption uh, to the to the community and and at grade. Uh, in our business case that I referred to, that's published in our website, we did look at a number of options, uh, both at grade, all underground and a mix of both. And the, the option that we're proceeding with now, which has that uh, elevated section for about one and a half kilometers that we've been talking about, that that uh, both balanced, that made the best kind of balance of the benefits from not being in traffic, having faster trains, you know, more reliable service, um, and the overall kind of costs of the project. Um, so that information's there, uh, at, you know, we're proceeding with this with this option and we're hoping that in our conversations with the community we can we can hear from you about you know what are the best ways to deliver this guideway um you know that is going to fit best with into that existing environment but also provide a really good transit connection to the community and to the broader city okay thank you um so there is the the guideway uh people uh are focusing on that uh and we talked earlier about noise walls and you mentioned uh that uh there isn't a need for noise walls uh and we've got a question here looking at the uh, elevation that we saw of the uh the design with the fins coming up from from the rail uh that have a, an impact visually of blending in um uh, is there a way to reduce noise in the guideway is the question when the gaps uh, are are when there are gaps between the fins so to to put it precisely you have mentioned that there's no need for sound reduction have you got studies about the level of sound that the public could look at uh that the public could understand how far away from the elevated section they're likely to hear a passing train and at what level what it would compare to um in order to understand why there is no noise mitigation great joseph yeah that's a great question and uh, I certainly would say wouldn't say there's no noise mitigation. I would never say that. Okay. Uh, we yes. were just referring to uh, what the work that's been done so far and whether we've identified a need for noise walls specifically. Um, so as part of the environmental studies and approvals that we referred to, there is a bunch of noise and vibration assessments that happen a part of that as part of that work, making some pretty conservative, assumption so start trying to say you know what if it's a bit noisier than we expect what what will it be uh, we've also heard loud and clear though from some of our engagements um, you know the focus of that work is typically around residents and other what they call receptors so there wasn't maybe as much of that work done for the park area so we are doing now a specific more detailed study which includes, you know, modeling of noise in the park. Um, so that's really designed to be able to, for us to understand to the best of our ability, you know, somebody who's uh, walking through the park, playing in the park, what are they gonna experience in terms of noise during the operation of this line? Uh, that information is gonna, that's gonna be the best information for us to decide, um, you know, what mitigations are required, but I think overall, I'd say our goal is to is that this line isn't going to be creating significantly different noise conditions uh, from what exists today. And there are lots of things that we can do um, to mitigate noise, you know, you and, and vibration, whether it has to do with the design of the tracks, you know, having rubber base under the tracks. There's lots of, you know, not just noise walls. There's lots of things that you can do. And uh, 
Elmira or Peter, is there anything you'd like to add to that? So Josh, uh, yes, um, and and I think you've you've broadly covered it. Um, the the only other thing I wanted to include to add is that uh, the studies you were referring to that that we are undertaking now in the parks, and um, the intent of that is to get the noise levels and um, uh, include that uh, commitment of that noise level as part of the um, as part of the uh, contract documents um, for the implementation or the construction of the elevated guideway. That way the, the construction company or the construction entity would would have to be uh, meeting a certain noise tolerance that we will have uh, uh, got out based on work that we've undertaken. And will, will those studies uh, be made available to the public at some point during during the coming months? So, so what I will say is that for the um, for the environmental assessment studies, there's a whole host of uh, information that's already in the public domain um, because environmental studies are public documents anyways. We have all of that now public. And um, uh, for the ones that we are undertaking now, uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at it and we'll, we'll get back um, and see what aspects of it we can make public. OK, uh, OK, so I, I take that as a maybe. Not not a that that the sound studies may may or may not be made public. Joseph, I think I, I, I think what Peter's saying is we don't have that work in hand. You know, our overall commitment is to be transparent. Um, yes, so that's we'll we'll take that back. We'll take a close look at that and see what we can make available. OK, thank you very much. Um, the next question, um, this is a big project. Uh, there have it's required political will. It's required commitments at both the federal and the provincial level. Um, Bob is asking this question. Uh, and indeed, I was just watching the, 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 the news at five just before we started out. Uh, and uh, as as always happens, uh, there are elections coming up at both the federal and provincial level. How sure are you, even if there was a change in uh, government at either level, that uh, this project is going to continue? How locked in are the funds? Uh, how confident are you that this will go ahead? Thanks, Joseph. I'm first of all, before I respond to that question, I've been told that some people are having trouble getting into the Zoom um, and are asking for the code. So the code is 845610. That's 845610. If you if you don't have the Zoom code. Um, so specifically to that question, I I, I mean I think you know if you ask the people on this call we're not the political experts we're not going to comment specifically on kind of outcomes of political decision making right uh but what what i would say towards that general question uh, and concern you know is this going to not happen um two things uh one i think it's excellent that we now have a funding commitments from two levels of government both the federal government and the provincial government. And we're, we're, of course, working very closely with the city of Toronto and city of Mississauga uh, as well. So this is not just uh, something that's being advanced by one level of government or by one government in particular. Um, secondly, is that we have also been working very hard uh, to advance the parts of the project to construction uh, that, that we can. So we took on a big piece of early works, which is the advanced tunnel contract. As I mentioned, uh, the work has started. So if, if you, you know, you will notice things if you go to the lawn shaft at Renforth and Eglinton. Um, and, you know, so that work construction is happening. This is not just purely a planning exercise. Uh, so certainly as that work gets underway, um what are you know certainly our intent would be we can continue doing that work okay thank you um 
The, the next question is about the Eglinton corridor. It's a major corridor. It's a busy corridor. Um, how are you going to handle traffic congestion or minimize the impact during uh, construction for those people who need to use the Eglinton corridor to commute? Yes, and that has been a, a comment that we've received uh, loud and clear. Um, I'll, I'll I'll give this one a shot, and then I'll I'll pass it on to uh, uh, to Almira if she has any more uh, color to add. So a few things. First of all, uh, as we looked at the planning of of the line, we've tried to do it in such a way that uh, minimizes traffic impacts. So an example is the elevated guideway we're putting that close to Eglinton but just out of the road and we're really kind of balancing um you know some of the uh disturbing a little bit of the edge of the park versus disturbing the road and trying to balance those two things another example is the underground stations so uh, and, and we talked about this um at the last engagement, but of the four underground stations, we are we are planning to put three of those just outside of the road so that the bulk of the construction can happen outside of the road. That's a little bit different than people's experience of Eglinton Crosstown. Uh, Kipling is is the one station that will be uh, just because of the adjacent development right under the road. And then uh, we will be developing in partnership with the contractors uh, detailed traffic plans uh, during construction and uh, Elmira or Peter maybe you can speak to that in a little bit more detail. Elmira what, what uh, Elmira, go for it. Trying to unmute. Uh, you pretty much covered all the aspects of the project from planning to the construction. So to minimize traffic impact we also have certain requirements in our contracts in terms of providing temporary detouring at uh, specific locations and additional lanes available during construction. Construction staging should be planned and should be approved by, by Metrolinx and um, our technical team. And uh, we will make sure that we have all the mitigation measures in place in order to minimize any impact to the traffic. And, and I'll just add, Joseph, um, in one of our engagements, I think there was there was some concern because pe people said we don't know what's happening and you're saying that the work is already starting. So uh, I and I realized that maybe we weren't being clear. So the work is starting at Renforth and Eglinton at the launch shaft, but any of the work for the tunnel uh, the rest of the tunnel alignment won't be happening until 2022. So there will definitely be lots of time for us to meet with you to walk through the details of the construction plans and the traffic mitigation. So all those details will be coming. One more okay. thing I'll add related to, to construction um, is that uh, Metrolinx has been around uh, now constructing a lot of projects and um, what we've been able to do, and I think we do that very well, is to use the previous con uh, construction uh, documents to inform as a starting point for the subsequent uh, construction uh, documents, and then add a layer of lessons learned um, to make sure that things that we didn't do quite well, we um, improve on the subsequent projects. And the other thing related to construction is that um, one of the biggest issues with construction is the unknown. So um, I think with our community engagement folks, what I think we've done and we've done very well is to communicate, communicate, communicate. And that is we want to let people know what's happening, uh, when it's happening, how long it's going to happen and the sort of impacts that will have on that individual. And then that way it gives um, the person um, choices to make and which um, if you know all of these uh, details, at least the choices you make are informed choices and um, that that reduces the sort of impacts you get from construction. Okay, thank you. There's a lot of info that you've provided, uh, a lot of info to unpack and that's really helpful. There's a question 
uh, about the extension to Pearson. But before we do that, why don't we see whether we have, whether Kelly Thornton, who's on standby over in the Zoom room, if Kelly has some people who would like to ask their questions uh, out loud, and we can all, we will then come back here uh, afterwards. Kelly, uh, do you have some questions? Hi, thank you, Joseph. Hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome to everyone to the, the Zoom room where participants can choose to ask a question verbally. Um, we take questions in the room based on order of hands raised, but I'm not seeing hands. Uh, I am seeing some questions in the chat. So uh, that means people would like me to read them out, which I'm happy to do. So we'll uh, get to the first one. And that was asked by Paul. Uh, Paul's question is, there is an existing roadway through Renforth Station. Is this railway being built to Renforth Station going to be built beneath the existing roadway? So Josh, I think you started, you, you spoke to the alignment at the beginning, um, but perhaps uh, Paul wasn't here. So if you could reiterate that. Sure. Please. And uh, I think if, if Paul is talking about the, the actual transitway road, um, I, I'm not sure if that's the road that Paul is talking about, the road that's used by the buses today to get to and from uh, the Renforth station. So in terms of, but I'll, I, I can describe it. So basically the actual launch shaft for the tunnel boring machines is just at the east end of the property at Renforth and Eglinton. Um, so when ultimately uh, construction is complete, the trains will come uh, out of that launch shaft at the east side of the parcel at Renforth and Eglinton, and then they will come just north of the of the bus station. So, and we're working hard to ensure a very good transfer uh, between the trains and the buses, so they can be, you know, they're not going to be mixed in with the buses, but that they but that they can be just north of the buses to, to make that transfer between the rapid transit and the bus as quick and as easy as possible. Okay, thanks, Josh. Uh, the next question was typed in the chat as well, and this is from Rob. Rob asks, why can't the rail travel above ground along the middle of Eglinton using the existing bridge? Josh, did you want so, to start that? Sure, sure. I was just uh, processing for a second. I think I think that this question is referring to the elevated guideway, um, specifically the the Eglinton Bridge that exists today over the Humber River. Um, so there's a couple things, and and we have had this question before. It's a, it's a really good one, um, but the uh, if the the train itself, overall, the goal is to ensure that it can be fast and reliable and then, and you know, separated uh, in its own right of way. Uh, the other thing is that then when the train crosses Scarlet Road, it needs to be high enough to go over the traffic. And as Elmira mentioned, I believe the number you use, Elmira, was six meters, right, above the curb that the the stations need to be so that you know that there's enough clearance for traffic so if if the trains were on the Eglinton bridge they would not then be high enough to go over Scarlet so then they would effectively be you know mixed in with the traffic at Eglinton and Scarlet so that's why and as you've seen in in the designs that the bridge there needs to be higher um, than the existing Eglinton bridge Thanks, Josh. Next up, we have Martin Green, who has his hand up to ask a question verbally. Go ahead, Martin. Uh, thank you. Uh, so it, it relates to the same topic. Uh, I, I was chair of the Eglinton West LRT Community Working Group. And uh, we actually, in our report, recommended the exact configuration that's, that's being adopted now. And the principal reason for, for this was to keep the LRT separated from the traffic uh, so that it would be both fast and uh, the trains could be run with two minute headways instead of four minute headways. So it basically doubles the capacity, the peak capacity of the line. And our concern was that that goal 
all the way to the terminus uh, at Pearson, uh, probably the, the, the new hub that's uh, this plan north, just north of the Pearson airport. Uh, so we could accommodate a, a, a much larger flow of traffic than you could with a, an LRT that uh, that has to interface with the uh, the roads and the traffic. So I guess the question is, is the planning uh, that's being done for that Pearson extension going to ensure that it stays separate from the roads all of the way to the, to the terminus? Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Martin. Nice to nice to kind of virtually speak to you uh, again. Um, so, in terms of the airport segment, uh, and and for those uh, who may not be aware, so planning work is underway. Is approximately a five-kilometer section from Renforth up to Pearson Airport. Um, so that planning work, in cooperation with Greater Toronto Airport Authority, is proceeding. Um, there, there is not at this point in time a funding commitment to the airport segment. So we are working through options and you know business case analysis of costs and benefits for different options. Um, and and we'll be coming back when we have more information. I would say to your specific question, Martin, um, you know the overall benefits that of of speed and reliability and frequency uh, offered by the separated uh, transit infrastructure is something that we're looking to maintain. Uh, but of course, that ultimately is subject to the affordability and to the level of funding that can be provided for, for the line. So it's certainly an aspiration. Uh, we'd like to make the trip to the airport as you know reliable and as quick as possible uh, in both directions. Um, but we 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 don't have that final information yet. Okay, thank you, Josh. Thanks, Martin. Uh, the next question is uh, I'll be reading it out, and it's from Cecilia. And Cecilia says the elevated guideway examples included Davenport Diamond. Construction and drilling was approved to happen from 7 a.m. to 3 a.m. from January 31st to July, impacting the community greatly. The community worked together, but we're only able to get the construction to end at 11. Are we to expect the same? Uh, so thanks for your question. I'm, I'm going to take a, a quick pass and then I'm going to pass it to John, who's been waiting patiently uh, to answer your questions. Um, so first of all, while we're definitely learning lessons from the Davenport Diamond, and I think there's a lot we can learn on the design as well, uh, and the engagement with the community, um, it's also not the same project. We're not building over an active railway. Um, we don't have the same uh, constraints in terms of very, very close uh, residential development for the majority of the section. So it's not it's not exactly the same in that regard, but I know your question specifically is about the timing of construction. I, John, is this something that you're able to speak to? And then maybe Peter? Um, well, in terms of the Davenport Diamond, of course, um, you know, it's there being, uh, you know, we are well aware about the issues around the length of the, the, um, work day in that area. And I think Josh did a good point of summarizing the issues. We also are, as Peter said earlier, we learn, we share lessons learned. And a very important part is that some of the lessons we've learned from Davenport, then we can bring forward and make sure that we um, spell out, you know, you know, give guidance to the the constructors about at what hours for what activities. It's not just about the length of working, you know, the working day, it's about the types of activities and when they happen. And so, um, you know, these are lessons that are gonna be brought forward from the Davenport Diamond project. So the objective is there'll be fewer impacts to this community. And also the kind of construction, as Josh said, is very different. Like the elevated guideway um, is gonna be going across Eglinton. The, the, you're gonna be underground in much of the areas where there's a lot of residential, you know, multi-unit residential projects or houses. So the impacts will be different and should be lesser. And um, also 
the impacts change as you move through different phases of construction and and sometimes the um the initial fa you know preparing the foundations for the guideway piers can depending on the construction methodology can be disruptive but i i doubt that you'll have anywhere near the same impacts because we're working right now to mitigate those impacts on this pro on the Davenport project as it's um, continuing its uh, its construction. Thanks, John. And Cecilia, just let's let's stay in touch um, as always. And as the plans get finalized with the West End connectors who will be doing the first portion of work, um, uh, we'll be able to meet with them and review their their construction plans and their mitigation plans and work together to make sure that local local impacts can be managed um, so that we can have those smaller group discussions where where we can really talk about unique needs uh, for people who live in close to the to the alignment. So let's stay in touch. But thank you. Uh, the next question I have is from Victor. I'm going to read this one out. Victor asks, do you believe the timeline for completion is accurate at this point or can it decrease or increase as things happen over the next few years? Josh? Sure. Um, so we've we've done a bunch of work on this, on the, you know, looking at the timelines, looking at schedules. These are very big projects, obviously. Uh, we believe that the project can be delivered uh, by the stated opening date of 2030-2031. Um, of course, there's always things that you can't predict, COVID being a great example um, that, that can come up. So, you know, we, it's very difficult to predict the future, but based on the construction that's required, uh, based on the, you know, the local conditions, uh, we believe we can definitely do this project in the timeline that's been committed. The other thing that that affects this is, you know, is the market, is the construction market, uh, the availability of materials, all of those things. And we also, you know, it, in this, you know, we're engaging uh, with the community. We also engage with the market to see what's happening there. Um, what will make these projects interesting to more bidders uh, and what input can they provide to to making sure that they can be built and are, and are of interest and are constructible. So lots of work happening in, in the transit industry, not just on subways, but on other projects. And so we're working to make sure that, you know, there's a good uh, market of available contractors also to be to, to be able to work on this project and we're and we're confident of that based on our discussions with them as well. Okay, thank you, Josh. I don't see hands up, um, but I we do have another question in the chat, so I'll read that one out. And the question is, if the crosstown connects with the up express, is a spur to Pearson needed? Josh? Yeah, that's a great question. So, A, we're very excited that, uh, you know, we'll have a connection between the Up Express and Eglinton Crosstown and the GO Transit uh, services at Mount Dennis. Um, you know, I think it really depends on, on markets. So, the connection that Eglinton will ultimately provide to the airport does something a little bit different than when the well, than what the up express does uh, the up express in terms of connections specifically to the airport is largely for passengers um, the connection that Eglinton provides to the airport is for passengers is for airport employees it's also for people coming from Brampton and Mississauga uh, on the bus that are looking to connect either into the airport corporate center or uh, areas through the center of Toronto. So it it provides that, you know, 33 kilometer single seat ride all along the middle of uh, from Mississauga all the way through Toronto. Um, so it does do something a bit different and makes a more attractive transit service to the airport and the surrounding area for a different group of people than the Up Express. So you will have two different choices in Mount Dennis, uh, ultimately, once the airport segment is built about how to get to the airport. But we don't think that they will be, you know, fighting with each other for the same people uh, in the way that you might kind of initially think about it. Great. 
Thanks, Josh. Uh, the next question I'm going to read again, uh, and that is, have the exact station locations been determined yet? I'm curious as to how close to each intersection the stations will be. Uh, great. So, Peter, would you like to answer this question? Yeah, let, let me let me uh, attempt to answer it and then I'll see if Omira wants to add a little bit more color to it. Um, so major infrastructure projects such as uh, ECWE uh, use local uh, population and employment projections um, as uh, to plan the uh, ridership um, or expected ridership on the uh, on the line. And the ridership is what we use to determine where the stations uh, or the locations of the station should be. Um, so uh, for ECWE, it's no, it's no any different. We've used the uh, long-term local population and employment growth projections and the, uh, the stop locations that we've identified are the um, uh, appropriate ones that are based on the, the ridership numbers that we've got. Um, Josh, any color or Elmira to that? Yeah, I mean, we just we have the seven stations that we've talked about. Um, we we are planning um, to do an upcoming public engagement in the fall specifically. Uh, you know, we're still designing, I would say, the, the menu of all the virtual engagement, but we definitely need to come back on stations. And there you'll get some much more detailed information about the stations and their location. Um, we're planning for them to be, you know, as close to the intersections as possible. Uh, to ensure, you know, good access to the north-south TTC bus routes um, and to the nearby areas and the and the planned growth as Peter was talking to. So yes, the, I mean, the short answer is proximity to intersections, yes, um, to make those good connections. Great, thanks. And with that, I don't see any other questions here in the Zoom room, but I'm going to ask Mike, uh, Mike Matos, I see you're, you're the only one on screen that I can see if, if you want to raise your hand physically, if you're having trouble clicking the button, just let me know before, before we go back to uh, the text option. Do you do I want was, to I was, pay, I was actually paying attention, but sometimes the space bar doesn't work. Uh, no, I, th I thought it was a good presentation tonight. I learned a lot. Um, I want to think about it a little bit and not waste your time on it. Um, it's, th there's a lot of questions still. Okay. But, if you don't want to ask one now, then, then we will head back to uh, the chat room. All right. Thanks. Over to you, Joseph. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so a couple quick questions looking ahead, uh, uh, and, and a couple questions have come in in the chat room about uh, the LRT uh, when it's in operation. One is the hours of operation. Uh, is, is this uh, going to run all night, or uh, when will it start and stop, just roughly speaking? Has that been decided? So that that level of detail of the exact service plans and the exact hours of operation is still work to be done. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I expect that it would be, you know, similar to the Eglinton Crosstown that's currently under construction. So that's that does not include service for the entire night. Uh, there needs to be at least a few hours at night to make, you know, maintain, do regular maintenance on the line, do cleaning, things like that, um, you know, in their kind of late night, early hours of the morning, probably similar to the subway line. Okay, and and for a person who would be uh, taking it, riding it, um, when you look at the uh, it in operation, how much time if I got on uh, at Ranforth Station and went to the Eglinton West uh, subway uh, station, how long would that trip take? So, um, first of all, I, I'm glad people are already thinking about. Uh, the service and the benefits that it's going to provide to them when this line ultimately opens. So that's 
exciting to see and exciting to think about. Um, we published in our business case uh, travel time predictions, which says that which indicates that you know compared to today, you'll have the transit trip from Renforth to Mount Dennis will be seven minutes faster. Um, I, I don't have the exact information all the way to Eglinton mm -hmm. West. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that because it will be separated from traffic, not only will it be faster, but it will be more reliable. Uh, you know, we've heard from the community a lot of the concerns around traffic, especially at places like Martin Grove and Eglinton um, that can get really, really congested. And so one of one of the advantages of this line is that you'll have a very predictable travel time because it is separated from traffic. So it's not going to be affected by, you know, exactly the time of day in that way. Uh, Peter, you don't miraculously have the number for the travel time all the way to Eglinton West from Renforth, do you? No, unfortunately not, Josh. I think I think on that question we'll have to take it back and then um, uh, respond sure. back in in writing. For sure. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll have to get back on that one, Joseph. All right. Um, when you are talking about the designs, public art, uh, art in the stations, um, what are the plans uh, that people can look forward to? Um, and uh, the reference is made here in, in a question from Eric Fergan to the concrete wall art at the Jane Street underpass at Highway 400. Okay, John, can you answer this one? Yeah, oops, yes, absolutely. So the concrete art that you're referring to, there is absolutely potential for this kind of art. Typically, Metrolinks, we're in the business of building transit, but that doesn't mean that we don't work with third parties. Um, and in particular, we, on many cases, uh, you know, if you're talking about, you know, retaining walls, portal walls, other kinds of, so, uh, you know, at grade infrastructure, we have a long history of working, collaborating with municipalities on these kinds of projects. So, though nothing is in the works today, um, I can assure you this kind of issue is coming up and being addressed on projects all across the GO expansion and on the Ontario line. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch uh, to a question that's got a lot of votes this evening. And if I, if the question doesn't read quite right to you, perhaps you can interpret and, and uh, explain. But the question is, why aren't you discussing proposed passenger station overpasses above Jane Street and Scarlet Road? They don't seem to be on any of the concept drawings, according to this comment. Um, can you talk about that a bit, please? Yes, they're there. Uh, they're not, you're right, they're not in the material. Um, this was focused on the design of the guideway, but elevated mm -hmm. stations at Scarlet and Jane are very much uh, part of the plan. We'll, we will be coming back on, on future engagements to show you renderings and uh, the layouts of those stations. The, the plan for those stations um, will be to, you know, they'll be just north of Eglinton, similar to the guideway, straddling Jane and Scarlet roads um, to, to provide again, you know, a really a good connection between the bus and the rapid transit. Um, so hopefully that provides a little bit more information. I think, you know, the, the virtual env uh, environment of these meetings also means that we, um, we can't just have a hundred slides because we'd be speaking for an hour and a half and we wanted to make sure that we have time for questions. So we will definitely be coming back on those stations. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, and uh, the uh, and let's switch over to the underground for a second. Uh, just in terms of the underground stations, Royal York, Islington, Kipling, Martin Grove, uh, how deep are those stations going to be? Uh, Peter, would you like to speak to that one? Yeah, I'll let Elmira speak to that. Uh, Elmira hasn't spoken for a little bit, so Elmira, go for it. Sure. Uh, this, uh, these four stations, the track level is about 16 to 18 meters below ground. So uh, 
this is uh, this is based on the tunnel alignment that uh, will be under construction starting next year. We will make sure that we will have all the station equipped with elevators, escalators, mm -hmm. and we consider accessibility in our design. Um, therefore, the depth uh, would not that matter if we 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 we, uh, we have all the equipment in place to have seamless access. From the from the street level to the platform level. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a, a planning for the for the future beyond this question. Um, is there potential? Have provisions? Is it been made uh, for the line to be extended past Pearson to Woodbine and then to the Finch LRT? People need to go north to south, not just east to west. Uh, so, is is that been contemplated? Are there potential options for that great love love the planning questions um so first of all finch uh, lrt is is a metrolinx project it's currently under construction um, from finch west subway station to humber college um so and that's supposed to be completed in 2023 that's the plan so that's that's what we're working on right now um there have been ideas um in planning conversations both by Metrolinx and by the and by city of Toronto about either you know extending the Finch LRT line to Woodbine into the airport or you know you could say vice versa of extending the Eglinton line so first of all when as we do the planning for the airport segment we'll we'll make sure that it's future proofed that it could be extended further if uh if if there was interest in in, in funding um and, and secondly, I know just, you know, in terms of Finch, uh, more of the focus is focused on extending Finch um, to Woodbine into the airport uh, and, and City of Toronto planning um, has requested, they've been requested by council to do a report back at the end of the year on the potential for that. Um, so there is some planning thinking about continuing to make that those connections. Uh, there's no firm commitments at this point, but it's definitely in the planning phases. It's also part of Metrolinx's long-term regional transportation plan. Okay, thank you for that. And that actually brings us to the end of our time for this evening's meeting. Um, to everyone who's participated this evening, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the people who've asked questions. There was a lot of interest during the meeting. And I think um, having been the moderator for some of these meetings, I've seen a progression of discussion. Uh, and I found your slide, Josh, early on about what we heard uh, to be very encouraging because it's not just about uh, people asking questions. It's about being heard and considered, and uh, that is good. And I want to underline that uh, it doesn't stop right here. For people who are watching this video right now, if you just look up above the video, you'll see uh, some menu items, including Get Engaged, where you could go, you could find uh, other uh, information, including station by station information. And very important, right there on the top of your screen, if you're there right now, is Contact Us. And that contact us will give you all of the information that you need to contact the community engagement team, including their email, the telephone number, and you can just fill out the form if you haven't done it yet to subscribe to be put on the newsletter so that you can be kept up to date during the coming months. So again, thank you very much everybody for attending tonight. We really hope that you found this to be useful and that you found it to be positive. You will be receiving a questionnaire in the next day or two asking you to rate this and asking you uh, how we could improve. That too is part of the process. So thank you all, have a good evening and please stay safe.